think it's 11 o'clock and we should um, get going. Um, there's a bit to run through this morning. Um, I'm going to have a look at some news. I'm going to um, hand over to Richard then, who's going to talk about something as well. And then he's going to be interviewing Stephen Inglis of Regional REIT. Um, should be quite an interesting chat, I think. So bits of news that I picked out. So we have a, finally have a sort of a new IPO. Well, there is one um, still ongoing, the 8085. We're still waiting to see what the outcome that's going to be. But um, Ashoka White of Emerging Markets is, is uh, pressed the button and trying to float. Um, we had some results this morning from GCP Asset Backed. Um, I thought I'd have a quick look at those. And then, as I say, Richard's going to be talking about the industrials read bid. Um, with Ashoka, um, so it just published an intention to float, um, and it's looking for £100 million. Um, it's going to be open to everybody. So there's a placing for personal investors and an offer for subscription and intermediaries offer for retail investors, which we can obviously think is good news. Um, the manager, you'd know because it manages the shaker in, in the equity. We'll talk a bit about that in a second. It's got about five and a half billion of dollars under management altogether now. And it the same sort of style as it's using for a shaker in your equity. So well-managed, scalable businesses with superior returns on capital attractive uh, valuations is the sort of tagline. Well, sort of. Um, and the same manager, um, Prashant, will be sort of leading uh, the charge on this, although he has got two co-managers alongside him. And there's quite a big team, actually, with, with Acorn. Um, it's one of these things that I was sort of was curious about, how they managed to make Tesla team with given the um, way that they run their fees. We'll come on to that again in a minute. Um, quite a diverse portfolio, so 102 positions. Um, that's more than the most, I think, uh, in this kind of sector. Um, and it's sort of some flexibility around what they can invest in, but really any sort of, that's sort of the edge, really. Um, I'm not sure it would be going up to 10% in any of those things. I suppose the only one that would make most sense would be frontier markets, it's places like Vietnam. Um, the prospectus will be out on the 18th of April. Um, and you'll have to apply by the 27th, 28th, if you're interested. And then, or if all goes well, it'll start trading on the 3rd of May. Um, so it's being done off the back of the success of Ashoka India Equity, and it has been a real success. So launch of the pound, now pound eighty. It's beaten its benchmark by about 39%. Uh, I think it was up to the end of March. Um, it's trading quite close to NAV, as you can see there on the line, and it has done more since launch. And it's now up to 203 million market cap. It started off at just 50, so that just shows you how well it's done, really. Um, so the Emerging Markets Fund is going to have the same fee structure as the Shoka India Equity. Uh, so there's no base management fee. Um, and it's all basically funded on the back of the performance fee, which is based on uh, performance relative to MSCI emerging in this case. I, I'm assuming, until we get the structures, we don't know for sure, but assuming it's the, it's like the same structure as AAE. Um, so that would be they take 30% of the outperformance over three year rolling periods, capped at 12% of time weighted average assets, which sounds like a lot because it could be a lot. I think that's the point. So I crunched some numbers here to see what um, actually they've earned out of this so far. So by the time they got to the end of June, so this thing was launched in um, 2018, about, about the year before, they'd only accrued 52,000 pounds in fees. And this is where I was saying I was slightly worried that they wouldn't be able to afford to keep it going. Um, but because the performance was so good in the subsequent periods, um, those numbers did pick up quite a bit. So 2.8 million uh, by the end of June 2020, 5.1 million uh, for June 21. But then they haven't accrued anything since. Um, we don't know what the number will be in June 23 yet, obviously, but um, at the moment there's, there's nothing in the, the bank for them. Um, they did get paid out £7.9 million pounds in June 21, so they're not exactly um, short of cash. But I think it, with these sort of fee structures, it's, it's totally up to you whether you think it's okay or not. Um, I get the incentive element of it. I, I get why it might be attractive. 
I would think it would be better to have a mixture of a smaller base fee and a smaller uh, performance fee, perhaps. Um, my crunch my numbers, I reckon had they just charged 1% no performance fee, then up to the end of December 22, they, the total fees on the fund would have been 5.6 million. It's a very rough number. Um, so they've earned more than that. Uh, but then they have performed very well. So maybe you think they deserve it. I'm going to meet them in, in, next week anyway. So I will um, report back somewhere or another, probably not here, but maybe on a city article or uh, maybe we'll do a QD view or something on the back of it, um, just to give you a bit more information. GCB Asset Back now. Um, I quite like this fund, but it has struggled um, since rates began to rise and it had a few as portfolio problems that have unnerved people, I think, and the NOV's come back a bit. And as you can see, the share price has come back a lot more. So there's a big discount opened up. Um, and the NOV has gone down over the accounting year that they've just reported on. So uh, down about 5p, or almost 5p. The dividends edged up a bit, and they have managed to keep the dividend climbing. Uh, it's by no means matching inflation, but nevertheless, it is still going up, which is not bad for a debt fund, really. And um, the things that hit them were uh, the right down of a co-living loan. We'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Some social infrastructure stuff. Um, they also lost their lead manager, and I think that um, there were some people too. And in response, because the discount's been wide, the, the board has been quite good about buying their stock. Um, and that's obviously, I think, uh, a good call um, for them. So they bought back 12 million shares since um, 14th of October when things got really sort of um, unnerved by the by David's departure. The co-living stuff, it was just too big a position, really, in retrospect. So they started off uh, by lending these people 5 million quid, and it was too against office, uh, sort of, not, it's against spaces that looked a bit like student accommodation, um, but were designed for um, people that um, needed accommodation fairly close to London, really, or, or big cities in the States, um, and were prepared to sort of compromise a bit on the sort of space that they had in their flats in exchange for some sort of communal living spaces. Um, it's a, it was a fairly good idea, I think, but it hasn't really worked in terms of what happened to it uh, with COVID. So um, when they breached their covenants, the natural thing was to try and sell the whole company and see trying to get the money back that way. That didn't really work. So they tried spinning out some co living assets. There was a, a brief plan to launch a REIT on the back of this that didn't fly. Um, so they've just been writing it down. Um, and there's quite a big write down over 2022 again. So it's only now four million pounds to portfolio. Um, you can see the reasons for that write down there. Um, most of those things. Um, probably not reversible, and so the, there might not be much more recovery to come. But um, there you go. I think a sort of lesson learned from that um, wasn't a pretty good idea. Um, on the social infrastructure side, they've they've had these problems with these multi-use community facilities for a while since already since COVID. Um, basically, it's a sort of mix of retail and um, leisure and. It, again, it's, it's sort of struggled a bit as a concept. They're trying out a new operator for the largest asset of the two that they've got. Uh, whether that works or not, we don't know. There has been some recovery in operations, they say, since COVID, which I suppose has been encouraging. They've also got some exposure indirectly to MySpace housing, which we know has been a problem for people like Triple Point and uh, to that much lesser extent, Civitas. Uh, this is one of the registered providers of, of social housing. Um, it's run into problems. Uh, the regulators clamp down on it. The properties they've lent against only account for 1.5% of Gary's portfolio. Obviously, the properties are still there. And this is the whole point about the asset back thing. They're supposed to be able to try and get the money back again. MySpace has not been paying rent. So the um, person who is uh, owning the properties has been receiving the income. And that's obviously um, affecting uh, their ability to pay rent to GCP asset back. Um, not great, but I think it will get sorted out. Uh, maybe quite soon. Um, on the management side of things, they've decided that they're just going to uh, keep the temporary team they've got in place as the permanent co-managers, so Joanne and Philip Kent. 
Um, we know Phil quite well because he does GCB infrastructure too. Obviously, that means he's quite busy. So I think Joanne would maybe sort of take a bit of the lead on this. We did talk to David Collin and Joanne on our show on the 8th of July. So if you want to listen back to that, that so it's been a bit more about the fund. But what I think is since that's almost a year ago now, what we'll do is we'll try and pencil them in in the summertime and catch up with where they are. There is a wider team there um, and they are trying to recruit uh, another body. Um, I'm not too worried that they haven't got the, the, the people to, to run this, but it would be better to, to have somebody dedicated. Um, and then in terms of portfolio, I do think it's, it's sort of looking a bit better. So um, the annual ICO's existing portfolio is 8%, but the new stuff that they, they're writing is 8.6. So obviously rising interest rates do flow eventually throw through to their income. Um, and that's good news. They've got a sort of weight of expected term of six years on what's in the portfolio now, which is good. They used to get a lot of prepayments because obviously as interest rates were falling, then their loans were progressively more expensive. As things are going the other way now, I think they might dry up a bit, which dents the income a bit because the prepayment income was, was quite helpful. It's sort of like sort of extra um, bit of income. Um, they're not too worried about the property in the state of this economy. Um, so property loans, the LTV is about 70%, which is not too bad. I mean, obviously people take mortgages at 95, that sort of thing. Um, there's 50 loans in the portfolio now, nine of those against assets under construction. That's normal for them because that's how they get the um, NAV uplifts and how that helps sort of keep the dividend going up as well. And they're valued on a weighted average discount rate of 8.4%. That's up from 7.5% at the end of 21. So um, I don't think it's too bad, really. But although um, it's, it's had a sort of bit of problems with the portfolio, I, I do think actually maybe this is um, looking interesting now on this discount. That's what the portfolio looks like now. It's, it has got a really broad spread of stuff. Some really interesting, innovative stuff in there as well. Football finance is a weird one for one. They talk about that a bit in the results because they, there's a half percent loan where um, actually that sort of slightly run into problems, but they think that's completely manageable and they will get the money back. Um, yeah, it's, I think it is worth a closer look if you've got the time. So that's enough for me. I'm now going to hand over to Richard and probably he'll share his screen rather than mine. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, James. I'll just put this into full screen mode. There we go. Right. Yeah. So as James mentioned, there's and it was announced a couple of weeks ago, there's, there's a, um, a deal for industrials REIT to be taken private by Blackstone. Um, they've agreed terms now. It's announced this morning, um, 168p per share, which is a massive premium to when it was announced um, early April. Of forty-two percent, and and they've announced today that that's going to be a material premium to their um, end of March now, which is yet to be announced. Um, so really interesting, um, especially at this this time in 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 the property sector where values are being sort of questioned, that um, that this deal will come about. Um, it needs at least um, seventy-five percent of shareholders support. The board is recommending it, and it will vote in favour of its shares and it's announced that it's also received letters of intent from other shareholders representing 22. So they've got about almost 30% already and I'm, I'm pretty sure it will be voted through and um, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll go through. It'd be a shame to lose them from the listed world. Um, I know them fairly well. Um, they were established in, in 2012 um, formerly called Stemprop. They had a lot of properties all over Europe, including some in the UK. In 2017, they bought a multi-let industrial portfolio um, and just put all their sort of eggs into that basket, really. So, so announced that they were going to change their strategy and become 100% focused on, on multi-let industrials in the UK. Um, that completed just last week, actually, um, when they sold their, fi uh, their final asset, which was a, uh, a care home portfolio in, in Germany. That finally completed. So they're 100% now focused on UK multi-let industrials. Uh, portfolio worth 
650 million. Um, interesting announcement at, for the end of 2022, um, talking about how their, their rents are going and stuff. So passing rent over 22 is up 5%. On new, new lettings and, and the renewals within the portfolio, they were up 31% on, on the previous passing rents, which is um, pretty impressive. Um, estimated rental value was also up 10.5% over the year. So just showing that the um, supply and demand dynamics in this sector are still really strong. <clears throat> um, and they what, what really sets them apart for me from the others is their <clears throat> um, industrials hive sort of online platform, the use of technology, um, setting that up, streamlining um, let, new lettings, um, taking out the sort of the long legal um, time periods that it can take to, to set up a new letting, bring that all the way down so void, void rates are, are lower um, and, and just driving through growth in, in, in rents really. That obviously attracted Blackstone and a lot of others. Um, and you'd think that um, with this deal 40% 40, 40 ahead of the price, it would have an impact across across the sector really just showing that actually the values um the, the the values that the market are putting on these companies are are, are way too low so i'll put a sort of list together here industrials wasn't in the aic um category so so it won't be on here but here's the um the uk commercial um and then at the bottom i've tagged in the uk logistics as well and just 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 show the the discounts that some of these guys are on and, and they're pretty hefty and we've also got regional re coming up that's 30 percent we we've obviously talk talk to Stephen about that but Ediston you you might remember a few weeks ago pretty much called time on there that they're looking to um merge with another re or or, or be sold they're, they're on a 16 obviously that's come in since they made that announcement but they were up at around so 20 30 percent as well and if, if it carries on like this I can see a lot more of this, um, these deals happening, sort of take private deals. Um, so yeah, as a sort of nice segue in there to, to, to get Stephen on.